ಸಂಘದ ಮೂಲಕ ತಂದು Normally we have a Buddha image, Buddha statue to focus for the first tray that we're going to use an empty seat. We don't need any iconography. We take the empty seat to be the, the object of our reverence. There's also an extinguished fire behind which is good imagery as well. So I'll do the first pages. ಭಗವತ್ತು ಅರ್ಹತ್ತು 
skipped a little. Hmm? You skipped a bit. Huh? What I have turned to. Turn the page marked up in the ceremony. Ima. Acharya Pamadina Dwaratena Katta Sapa Aparata Kamata Levante Congratulations on your first opening ceremony. You are now officially inducted into the, uh, the ranks of the initiated. So 
I'd like to start by expressing my appreciation for all of you coming here to undertake a course in uh, Vipassana meditation. The Buddha said, Kano ho ma upachaka. Don't let the moment pass you by. Opportunity that we have to come to practice meditation at this time. It's just a brief moment in time. Even our life is just a brief moment in time. But the opportunity that we've found isn't just to be born. Being born is something that we're pretty good at. We're born again and again and again. And there doesn't seem to be anything particularly special about this life of ours, for the most part. Except that it is quite special. This opportunity is something that's hard to come by. First of all, we have the opportunity to be born in a time when uh, the Buddha Sasana is still here. It might feel like we missed our chance because the Buddha is no longer alive, but we still have the teaching of the Buddha. And if we look at the texts where we see the words of the Buddha recorded, we can see that there is still something very special to be found in the world. It's something that's not always here. After some long period of time, for sure, the, there will be no more teachings of the Buddha. It will pass away into myth when no one understands or knows how to practice it, and eventually it will disappear entirely from the, the world. Further, we have the opportunity to be born as a human being. Life as a human being is something that is considered quite special. We're born as a, an animal, or a, we could have been an animal. There are many animals in the world who have no opportunity to learn the Buddha's teaching. So instead of being one of the animals, we got to be one of the humans. It's a very special thing. Of course, from a Buddhist perspective, it also means that. Uh, we have a very short window of opportunity because, of course, after this life is over, we're not sure to be born a human again. And the third, we have the opportunity to uh, be able to undertake a meditation course. And many people don't even have the opportunity. Some people who wanted to be here but couldn't be here but many people who are just in a situation where they're unable to take the time. They're unable physically, unable mentally, unable in terms of their situation. People who want to go to do a meditation course but can't. And they have the opportunity. All of these things are the chance that we have, the good luck that we have, to come to practice the Buddha's teaching. Uh, uh, physical situation allows for it. But finally, the, the fourth opportunity that's hard to find is to have the mental capacity or the mental e uh, inclination to come to practice. Many are the people who, who uh, don't even care about meditation. It's very few to find people who are interested, not just in meditation, but in their own spiritual well-being in working to better themselves spiritually, mentally, psychologically. It's hard to find people who are truly interested in becoming better people, and bettering themselves uh, in terms of the quality of their minds. But even rarer are those who, who wanting to or, or, or feeling inclined towards in their own betterment actually take the opportunity. 
It's easy to procrastinate or to think, oh, that's something I should do. We hear this a lot about meditation. Yeah, meditation, something. I should really get into that sometime. It's not easy to actually take the plunge and to start undertaking the practice of meditation that all of you have done at, through the at-home course and even more that you've undertaken by coming here. This is a real great leap of faith. Uh, it shows that you have great uh, conviction, self-conviction. You, you believe in yourself. And you believe in, in this practice as well enough to come here. So I'd like to appreciate that first and foremost. What we're coming to practice here should be very familiar to all of you. You've all at least read the, the material on it. Most of you have done the at-home course or at least part of our at-home course. So you already know what to expect uh, in terms of the content. But the basic teachings and the basic foundation of, of what we're doing here, it's very important to keep in mind. So I'm going to go over it again, even though it should be familiar to all of you. I don't want you to just think to yourself, I know this information. I want you to remind yourself, yes, this is what I should be focused on. First of all, we're focused on what we call vipassana. We practice vipassana and or we, we, we practice to attain vipassana. And what we practice is called satipatthana. So what we practice all together is called vipassana or satipatthana vipassana. And there are four satipatthana. Kaya, Vedana, Chitta, Dhamma. So I'm going to have you recite one more thing with me here. And I know that some of this might seem to some of you like a little bit too ritualistic or um, beside the point, right? Because ritual, of course, isn't a big thing in Buddhism. This is the only ritual you're going to have, and I didn't even make you bow. So, you're pretty lucky. We don't focus too much on ritual, but ritual serves a purpose. Because otherwise, it wouldn't have had the very direct... A reminder of all of the things that we went through in the ceremony. And the same goes for reciting teachings. Uh, I'm going to have you repeat something to me, and it's not that these are magic words that are going to make you enlightened. It's that by repeating them to yourself, you'll have them in mind. This is, think of it as primary school. In Buddhist studies, the first thing you do, when I went to learn Pali, they said to me, Put aside your thinking. Memorize first, think later, he said, my Pali teacher. Memorize first, think later. Well, we're not going to worry about thinking too much, but certainly memorize first and then practice after. Uh, it's, it, we're used to, in the West, often um, the sort of thinking about our subjects and, and trying to understand them. Understanding doesn't do us a lot of good in this practice. Understanding intellectually. What you'll find is that if you learn techniques, the techniques will help you see. And you'll gain an understanding that goes beyond any kind of intellectualization. We don't need a lot of intellectualization, only the understanding of what is being taught. So I'm going to have you repeat, and then we'll go through it so you'll understand, and then right away we'll go into it. Uh, practice. So everybody repeat after me. Satipatthana Vipassana Kaya Vedana Chitta Dhamma Satipatthana Vipassana Kaya Vedana Chitta, Chitta Dhamma, Dhamma. Satipatthana Vipassana, Vipassana Kaya, Kaya Vedana, Vedana 
Chitta Dhamma Okay, now you say it. Say it three times, please. Satipatthana vipassana kāya vedana citta This is Pali. I could have had you memorize in English, but it doesn't have the same ring to it. Better you learn the Pali words, especially because some of them are hard to translate. So I know it, it's unfamiliar, uh, as new things always are, but don't be discouraged by that. Uh, new things, we're, we're all able to learn new things. It's a part of the practice. So satipatthana, vipassana. Vipassana means seeing clearly. Insight's probably not a very good translation. Better to think of it as seeing clearly because the Buddha quite often talked about seeing. This is all about seeing, not with your eyes, of course, but seeing as if seeing for yourself, as opposed to hearing about it from someone else. Like if you hear about an elephant, someone says, oh, an elephant looks like this, and they describe it to you, and to tell you about the big elephant they saw, but it's very different if you go off into the forest and you see the tracks of the elephant, and then you start to imagine what could this elephant look like, but then you finally see the elephant. It's like that. So this isn't something I can explain to you, nobody can teach you how to become enlightened, obviously you have to practice on your own. So when we talk about vipassana, it's important not to become too theoretical about it. What is vipassana and what are we trying to see clearly? We're trying to see clearly the three characteristics. Many of you are familiar with these, impermanent, suffering, and non-self. So it, it's, it's a trap sometimes that people fall into trying to find these things, like actively thinking about what it is. Is that impermanence? Is that suffering? Is that non-self? It's like seeing an elephant. When you see an elephant, you see its trunk, you see its ears, you see all its many characteristics. You don't have to go looking for them. What the three characteristics are, are the realization of the absence of their opposite. So in our lives, we're constantly seeking out what might be stable, satisfying, controllable, or, or self, you know? me, who am I? And in meditation, we do the very same thing. Um, Without actively trying, we just naturally seek out meditation that is stable, satisfying. We seek out experiences in meditation that are stable, satisfying, and controllable. The problem is that reality is not. And it's a problem. Because if reality were, if there was something that was stable, satisfying, controllable, that would be what we should seek out. It's not that we're trying to avoid things that are. So you don't have to run away from things that you think are stable, satisfying, and controllable. You have to be mindful and, and uh, observe them carefully. And what you will see is that, oh, actually, these things I thought that were stable are not stable. It's a why in the beginning mindfulness meditation is often quite uncomfortable. Because you're looking for the opposite, and, and you're discouraged when you don't find it. Everything seems unstable. Something must be wrong. I, I, I can't make it smooth. No matter how hard I try, it's constantly changing. And I feel un, un, uncomfortable. You start to see that the things you hold on to, you try to cultivate, and it's just not working. So you feel uncomfortable suffering. You try to control, you try to make it stable, make it satisfying, you see that you can't. You start to see all three of these characteristics. All of you should have already. Uh, those of you who have done the at-home course should have some sense of this already. 
but just be aware that this is what we're trying to see. Because what are the benefits of seeing it? Well, this is what helps you let go. All of our problems in life come from clinging to things that are not stable, not satisfying, not controlling. Once you see that, you'll stop clinging. That's all it is. You don't have to make yourself let go or try to let go. Just try and see clearly the way things are. You'll see that everything inside of ourselves and in the world around us is unstable, unsatisfying, and uncontrollable. This is vipassana. Sati patana, patana means a foundation or establishing. Sati we translate as mindfulness. So we have these four things that we use to establish mindfulness, or they're the four foundations, if you will, of mindfulness. You, you can think of establishing as kind of the way our mind should be. Uh, because when we experience reality normally, I'll talk about this tomorrow, I think. When we experience reality normally, we, we, our mind is very unstable. So it immediately reacts and, and proliferates. So establishment is like getting your mind set on the actual experience, not going anywhere. My mind is not going anywhere. I see something and that's where my mind is staying, on the scene. So that's what sati is all about. It's about setting up the mindfulness. Mindfulness isn't a very good translation. Uh, I'll talk about that as well tomorrow. Uh, but what I'd like to remind you today is of the four foundations of mindfulness, because this is sort of the framework of our practice. The Buddha called these four our boundaries. So we should never go outside of the four foundations of mindfulness. He said, when you go outside of these, that is the realm of Mara. Mara, like Satan, the evil. Well, just the realm of evil, where all of our problems come when we leave the four foundations of mindfulness. So the four foundations of mindfulness, kaya, vedana, jitta, dhamma. Kaya means the body. So when you watch your foot moving, step, bend, right, lifting, placing, lifting, moving, placing, and so on. This is mindfulness of the body. You're aware of the foot moving. When you sit and say rising, falling, that's body. We deny his feelings, but specifically not not physical sensations. Feelings here means three three things: pleasure, pain, and calm. There are three kinds of way to know. So when you feel pain and you say to yourself, pain, pain, that's way to know. You feel happy, saying happy, happy when you feel calm, you say calm, calm. This is way to know. Jitta is the mind, and basically refers to thinking. Thinking about the past, thinking about the future, good thoughts, bad thoughts, any kind of thought, just say to yourself, thinking, thinking, doesn't matter what. This aspect of it is just the, the, the mind, the activity of the mind, the thinking. Dhamma is lots of different things, but first of all, it's the five hindrances. Liking, disliking, drowsiness, distraction, doubt. Again, this should be familiar to you, but just keeping with the tradition, I'm going to have you repeat after me again, just so you are sure you have these in your mind. Liking, liking disliking, disliking, drowsiness, drowsiness distraction, distraction, doubt. doubt. Liking, liking, disliking, disliking drowsiness, Distraction, distraction, doubt. doubt. Now you say it. Liking, disliking, drowsiness, distraction, doubt. Okay. So liking, if you like something or want something, say liking, liking, wanting, wanting. If you dislike something, disliking. Or if you feel angry or frustrated or bored or sad or afraid, all of these are contain the. the the base of disliking is say to yourself, angry, angry, frustrated, bored, bored, sad, etc. If you feel drowsy or tired, say tired, tired, drowsy, drowsy. If you feel distracted or worried or restless, you can note any of those, worried, worried, restless. Distracted means thinking a lot. So instead of just saying thinking, if you're thinking many different things outside of the 
practice unrelated to the practice, just say to distract them and distract them. And if you feel doubt or confusion, say doubting, doubting, or confused, confused. Okay. These are the five hindrances, so they're important because they will get in the way of your practice. If your practice is not going well, one of these is involved for sure. So rather than try to judge what you're experiencing, try to see how you're reacting to it. That's where the problem will be. And these aren't really a problem. They're, it's just that we see them as a problem and they fester and, and build and, and based on our reaction. So again, we're trying to not react to just remind ourselves this is liking, this is disliking, and so on. Okay, so that's the four foundations of mindfulness. That's the first thing for us to think about uh, while we're here. It should be, again, very familiar to you. I'm not going to give too much more Dhamma today uh, because we have several other things to talk about. One thing I want to talk about is um, the opening ceremony because there are a few things that we really should keep in mind, uh, most especially the eight precepts. So since you've been here, you've been expected to keep the eight precepts already, but now it's formal. And I just want to go over these just for some of the details. First of all, no killing includes mosquitoes, ants, but it does not include unintentional killing. So if you step on an ant without realizing it was there, you're not guilty of killing. You haven't broken a precept. Only intentional killing, like if you have mosquito spray or something and you go around spraying cockroaches or mosquitoes or something or step on a cockroach or spot a mosquito, please don't do that. They were probably your mother or your father or both in a past life. Uh, no stealing, uh, so this includes things in, around here, you, if, you, if there's something you're not sure it's for public consumption, please ask Jeff or, or Adder, um, there are two organizers for this course. Uh, number three, no romantic activity, so this means really no touching, you shouldn't be touching each other. Uh, and certainly not flirting and obviously no sexual activity for the duration of the course because you're you're expected to to um, put yourself in in a special dedicated situation again this isn't the five precepts this is the eight so remember no sexual or romantic activity number four no lying now that's an ordinary precept obviously Lying is very bad. If you lie to me, that's going to cause lots of problems, but don't lie to each other. But something I would say here that we're all kind of aware of is that speech during a meditation course can be a real problem. So our general rule of thumb is if it's not necessary speech, then it's wrong speech. And that's really true. It's just that in daily life, we're not so picky about technically wrong speech. If you're chatting about the weather or the blue jay, the sports teams or whatever. It's wrong speech, but only very technically. Something that only an arahant is free from. But here in the meditation course, we want to be as close to that as possible. So it, while you're here, if it's not necessary speech, it's wrong speech. And you should try to be aware of that. You're not breaking the precept. If you lie, you're breaking the precept. But I would ask that for the most part, we don't talk. And if you have to talk, if it's necessary, then, then it's right speech. Just make sure that there's some important reason for speaking. Number five, no drugs or alcohol. We'd ask, those are obvious, absolutely no uh, prescription medication should be cleared by us. Uh, absolutely no, uh, well, if you're taking medication for mental illness, we have to have to know about it. Uh, but we really have to know about any medication you're taking, I think. And uh, we try to recommend staying away from caffeine. I don't know if there is any drinks with caffeine here. Probably we've already taken care of that. But just for your awareness, caffeine can get in the way of the practice. It's not really a solution for feeling tired. Not in the long term. Uh, and, and be careful with any medication you're, you're taking otherwise. Pain medication is to be used sparingly, if at all, that sort of thing. But it's good if you let us know if you need to take that sort of thing. 
only eating in the morning, so you can eat from the time it starts to get a little bit light out until midday, which is approximately 12 noon. Outside of those hours, you can have uh, fruit juice, uh, vegetable juice even, as long as there's no pulp in it. Tea is also allowed, but herbal tea. Uh, number seven, uh, no entertainment, but also no diversion. During a meditation course, we'd ask that, again, we talked about this, no reading. You can read the booklet, but try not to read it ten times to memorize. Some people actually do that. Please try not to get too much into reading, because the act of reading gets in the way of your practice. Just the act of it is distracting and it hurts your concentration. And obviously no connection with the outside world, so no internet. You, hopefully everyone has, has uh, not secretly kept their phone or anything like that. Uh, no turning on a computer or something like that during the course. Uh, and try not to write journals if you need to write down questions or important things. You can write them down, but we encourage not, for the same reason, not to write journals because again it involves discursive thought. And, uh, just creates distraction in the mind. So write, write what needs to be written, that's fine. If you have questions or whatever. And number eight, uh, sleeping. So you've probably been given a bed, that's fine. We're not too concerned with what your bed is like, but we're much more concerned with how much you sleep. So we'd ask during the course that you not sleep more than six hours. Uh, this isn't a hard, hard limit, but you really shouldn't be sleeping more than six hours. If you are, try and work on it, that's all. Uh, but just be aware, we expect from the beginning that everyone should be six hours or less. If you seem to sleep less, that's fine. Try not to nap. If you have to nap because you didn't get any sleep, that's fine. But try to get into a habit of, you know, if I only slept four hours, that's what I got, four hours. If you fall asleep sitting, that's okay. And if you really need to lie down and sleep, you know, as a last resort, it's not forbidden. But if you find yourself doing that every day, then you should consider you have a bit of a problem and try to work to free yourself from that. So those are the eight precepts. The only other thing I have to say is a reminder, and it should be a reminder because you've all been through the first stages of the course, is that you're expected, as from the very beginning, to be mindful outside of practice. Now, when you're doing the at-home course, you can only do that so much. But while you're here, you really are expected throughout the day as much as you can to be mindful of the four postures, walking, standing, sitting, and lying. When you walk anywhere, say to yourself, walking, walking. When you're standing, standing, standing. When you're sitting down, sitting, sitting. When you're lying down, lying, lying. Mindful of the movements of the body, bending, stretching, reaching, pulling, pushing. Everything you do, you can be mindful. Try, especially during this course, to do it whenever you can. Uh, when you're eating, you can say chewing, chewing, swallowing, noting the tasting as well. Uh, when you're brushing your teeth, brushing, when you're working, whatever you're doing during the day, try your best to be as mindful as you can. You really, the point is that that's your only real duty while you're here, is to be mindful. You don't have to worry about the future. There's no job interview tomorrow, or exam, or deadline. You don't have to worry about the past. It has no bearing on what you're doing here. Whatever's happening now, just try to bring yourself back and, and be mindful of it. And also the senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking. Try to be mindful of these whenever you can. When you see something, don't just stare at it. Say to yourself, see. When you hear a sound, hearing. When you smell a good smell or a bad smell, smelling, smelling. When you taste something sweet, sour, salty, whatever taste, just say tasting, tasting. When you feel something on the body, feeling. And when you're thinking, of course, thinking. Try your best throughout the day to continue your practice. So it's not about how many hours of formal practice you do. It's about how continuous your practice is throughout the day. Okay. That's all I have to say. I think uh, one of the organizers, we have to talk a little bit about uh, reporting. It's all going to be held in the afternoon, and they may have other things to say as well.